disclaimer because it has been brought to my attention that some of the things I'm about to say are a little bit out there. Um, and so I feel like I want to qualify that by letting you know that while I live in Berkeley, I am a New Yorker. <laughs> not only am I a New Yorker, I'm a fourth generation Brooklynite, okay? So I am not woo-woo. <laughs> So for those of you who are woo-woo adverse, I want to invite you to trust the New Yorker <laughs> and just come along for the journey, okay? So I want to start by sharing a, uh, a quote that comes from a spiritual teacher who once said to me, betrayal is often one of the most powerful uh, gateways to enlightenment. So these words has shaped my turnaround in many ways. And uh, one of the ways that it has shaped it is when it delivered me on a rainy Thursday morning in the fall of 2010 to the gates of San Quentin Prison. But before we go through those gates, I want to invite you back to 2007 when I found myself in the midst of a pretty intense health crisis. Um, the experience of being in my body at that time, the way I described it to friends, was I felt like I had been through a fire. And, uh, and I had lost my skin. So everything and everyone and all that everybody was going through, I just, I felt it viscerally and it literally, it, it, felt, like, um, it felt like flames in my body and I had no filters and I had no boundaries. And uh, that was a constant feeling and uh, the experience of that was pretty overwhelming. So the New Yorker in me, uh, for some reason, thought I would just tough it out um, so just kept going about what there was to go about, and uh, that didn't work so well. Left some relationships in shambles, and uh, left my health much worse. And eventually, I decided to go to the doctor. <laughs> and uh, when I got there, I was diagnosed with uh, severe adrenal depletion, hypothyroidism, severe anemia, severe depression, and uh, the equivalent of a six-month pregnancy worth of tumors in my uterus. So the doctors wanted to medicate and operate, but they couldn't offer me any explanation for how I had gotten this sick, nor could they offer me any reasonable expectation that this procedure or these pills were gonna prevent the symptoms from all coming right back. And that didn't make sense to me as a way to go about healing. So I kept looking. And in the process of looking, the experience of feeling overwhelmed became increasingly overwhelming to the point where um, I, I didn't want to be in the body anymore. I didn't want to be in my skin anymore. Um, and I started trying to craft a way out, an exit strategy. And the problem was I'm kind of not a violent type and I'm not really into pain and I'm clearly not into prescription medication, so I couldn't come up with anything. Um, the best I could come up with was trying to overdose on like herbal tinctures. <laughs> so that wasn't going to work and that bought me some time. And uh, in the space of that time, I started contemplating and really thinking about what is it about this life that feels so unbearable to me. And what I realized was um, all the places where I was living in fear or avoiding the things that I was most afraid of. So since I couldn't figure out a way to get out of the body, I figured my other alternative was to figure out how to get more fully into my body and into my life. And, uh, and to me, that meant that I had to figure out how to not only live with, but learn to love and trust the things that I was most afraid of. And at that time, the thing that I was most afraid of were these tumors. So I created a meditation practice for myself where daily I would sit with my hands lovingly on these bulbous growths in my belly and ask them, why are you here? And what are you here to teach me? And surprisingly they answered. <laughs> and what they said is we are here because you have been raped multiple times by people you knew and by people you trusted, and you processed those experiences like you were getting your car repaired. 
So that guidance um, had me think a little bit about that betrayal quote. And when I first thought about the, the teachings of that betrayal quote, I thought it was really about me looking at all the places in my life where I had been betrayed, where trust had been betrayed. And, um, and this tumor guidance made me start to recognize that those events were actually just gateways to me recognizing all the places where I had betrayed myself. And one of the places where I had betrayed myself was in not claiming my story as a survivor. So it took me about 15 years to be able to stand up in front of somebody and look them in the eye and say, I was raped. I was forced to have sex with somebody against my will. It was not my choice. It was not my fault. I did not deserve it. So the New Yorker and me figured, if we're gonna really do this practice, then we should go to the place where the audience would be least receptive and supportive of me claiming this story, which is what delivered me to the gates of San Quentin Prison. <laughs> and uh, I went there to participate in a process called uh, Victim Offender Dialogue, which is a restorative justice process. And I was asked to uh, be on a victim panel Okay, it feels really important to note the notion of panel completeness marketing. Okay, it was me, it was my friend who came to support me, it was a facilitator, and it was 40 men serving life sentences. Right, no panel. <laughs> um, and the format of the panel really was to invite me to share my story and to give them an opportunity to listen. So I spoke for about 30 minutes in pretty graphic details about the experiences of the rape and, and actually more importantly, the, the aftermath of, of, of the rape and how it had affected my life, my relationship to love, my relationship to sex, my <coughs> relationship to men, my relationship to trust. And then I was pretty convinced that this room of hardened criminals had probably heard about as much as they could take. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I can just wrap it up. And I kind of closed my eyes and tried to organize my internal chatter. And beyond that internal chatter, I heard this really profound silence that, you know, invited me to open my eyes. And when I opened my eyes, I actually looked around the room and was surprised to notice that a significant number of the men actually had tears in their eyes. And as I kind of felt into the silence of that moment, the silence really invited, if there is more for you to share, then we have more to hear. So I spoke for another 30 minutes, also in graphic detail, and then was really convinced that's about as much as this room full of dudes can take. <laughs> so I closed my eyes to just kind of organize my thoughts and again heard the silence. And opened my eyes and looked around the room and almost all of the men had tears in their eyes. And again, the silence invited, if there's more to say, then there's more for us to hear. So I continued to speak, and I actually ended up speaking for the better part of two hours. Um, and it was the most comprehensive iteration of my story as a victim that I've ever told to anybody in one sitting. I mean, I told it to my therapist, and that's a 50-minute session, so I had two hours. And, um, and that was what I went in there to do, right, was to claim my story. So that felt really healing and transformative. But that wasn't the gift of the experience. The gift of the experience for me was the men. Um, after I spoke, they were given an opportunity to ask questions if they wanted to. And before each one of them spoke, they would you know, stand up and look me in the eye and every single one of them, again, had tears in their eyes and said to me, I'm so sorry that those things happened to you. And I had never realized that no men in my life had ever said that to me. Most of the men that uh, I told, their response was, well, you know this guy, well, who is he? Let me go kill him. Mm -hmm. Which was not actually of service to me, right? That was more in service to their discomfort with the fact that this kind of thing went on. And it was, uh, 
it was significant to be in a room full of men who had chosen to let themselves be impacted by my story. So when I heard them say, I'm sorry, what I heard them say is, I feel sorrow. And that was a choice. They didn't have to be there. They didn't have to let that pain and that suffering in. But they did because they recognized that if they could let themselves be emotionally impacted by the stories of survivors and victims, that that was the best likelihood of them never hurting or harming somebody again. And so that's what the victim offender dialogue process is about and a lot of what restorative justice is about. So as I left the gates of St. Quentin, that invited me to step into the gates of the work that I now do, which is called Fierce Allies. Um, and Fierce Allies is a body of work that I've developed that supports people in um, having fiercely honest dialogues about all the things we know we need to be talking about but we're often not talking about because those, relationships, those conversations are really high risk. And largely the groups that I am training and facilitating through these dialogues are groups where there is a history of hurt and harm between them. And the, the principles of the work are a lot of the principles in the story, um, learning to live with love and trust those that you are most afraid of choosing to be impacted by the ways in which your choices may have hurt or harmed somebody else. And you know, I think most importantly, creating a culture and a community where people are invited to reclaim the places where they betrayed themselves by not speaking up and not telling their story and creating a space where people really claim that and speak passionately about what is most important to them and what they love. So that's, that's what the work is about. And if you want to learn more about that, you can you know, go on the web at fearsallies.com. Um, but it, it feels like uh, you know, that work is very much shaped by this turnaround. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to share that story. And I just want to um, share my, my theme. Um, and this is a, an egg that was given to me by um, an elder in my, in my spiritual community. And it just, for me, feels like it represents um, the potential that came from having tumors in my womb. Um, so yeah, that was what I wanted to share. Thank you all for listening.